All right, we're back for round two. Ty and Kale, I'm the Canada. He's our tech director, and this is uh, our inaugural, whatever we call it, kitchen cabinet uh, campaign 2020. I'm the candidate running in the U in Utah's second congressional district as a Democrat. Uh, I think we've got some real momentum. We've got a great team. We've got supporters and maybe people on the fence, or we probably have people who aren't supporting us. But anyone who's who's listening or watching, uh, we're grateful you're spending time with us. So I had started with the campaign update, a little bit about each of us. Now I want to <clears throat> shift to the issue that we're all focused on, and that's this virus, COVID, uh, COVID-19. Sure. Being in a place like Fallujah for three years or in the eastern edge of Afghanistan, where Osama bin Laden used to live representing our country, what I learned um, in my role in all those places was pretty straightforward and, and pretty um, important. Uh, bad policy, incompetence in government gets people killed. Um, but what I saw in my job working with Marines of all ranks, whether they were corporals, captains, colonels, or all the way up to three and now four-star generals, is that when our, our government fails um, at a policy level, at a preparation level, at a wisdom level, uh, people get killed. Marines get killed, soldiers get killed, Iraqi civilians get killed. Fast forward to today. Um, none of us want to be where we are. Um, but I think we need to think hard about how we got here. What this COVID virus, I think, has shown is that this is a similar situation that I tried to get to in my book, which is if we don't have big people and big jobs with a lot of experience and wisdom, and I think a lot of good judgment, uh, people can die. And it tears us all up to see the images of uh, body bags um, in our in our cities. I was a living in New York for almost four years when I represented our our country at the U.S. Mission to the United Nations. And I look at those images from another, quote, hometown I used to live in, and I think, how did we get here? Well, I know how partly we got here, which is we have the wrong people in government. Um, we've got people, I think, that treat governing as a game. I think that we've got people that view the red and blue divide as something to be encouraged. I think, yes, and I'll name Mr. Stewart, someone who has put um, himself and one president over the interests of the United States of America. But the net effect of that is, is failed policy gets people hurt, it gets people killed. And that's a theme I'm going to continue to come back to. Because I don't want to be talking about it. I thought I had written a book that I had to write. And I was about to sell to my editor, hi Tim, I hope you're watching from Brooklyn, hope you're doing okay, um, my next book, which was about moral courage. But I thought, no, this year is just more important that I get in this arena, that I run for office, that I talk about my biography, which is pretty serious, and I think in serious times we need serious people. So we'll get into more of that. So I want to shift to where I think the failures have become very uh, apparent and dramatic. Um, and it's pretty much apparent to all of us uh, every day of the week right now and why we're doing this rather than talking to you in person. So Mr. Stewart is the current office holder, uh, second congressional district. I've never met him. Um, I hope I have that opportunity. I promise to be res respectful, but direct and blunt. And of course, there's a reason why I'm running. I don't think he's doing a good job. I think he's failed many Utahns, if not all of us, and I think he has put self-interest and party interest over the interests of our country. And I don't say that as a political person. I say that as someone who spends a lot of time thinking about policy challenges and how to fix challenges, how to find better solutions. I write about being in Helmand or Fallujah, and my job in those wars was to work with mayors and governors, Iraqi mayors, Afghan mayors, to be working with Marines after the biggest battle of the Iraq war in Fallujah when half the city was leveled. Think about it, half of a city of about half a million people was leveled. I walk in with Marines and we're charged with rebuilding that city. Infrastructure, sewer lines, power lines, water, city councils, finding Iraqis to come work with us. So I've, I've had a lot of um, tough challenges in my prior career and I like to say I have a lot of scar tissue because of that. 
but that scar tissue, I think, has prepared me for what I'm, I'm asking for your support, which is to, to be elected. And again, if you're the Republican, if you're the independent or unaffiliated, I'm talking to you too. I'm not just talking to, to Democrats here. Um, so Mr. Stewart, we'll have plenty of time to uh, engage virtually with him until he's ready to debate us in person. One of the delegates in Washington County raised a good question today on the the Zoom conference, which is how are you going to get Mr. Stewart to debate you? Well, if he chooses not to debate me, if I'm fortunate enough to be the nominee, we'll make that very clear about what that means. It means he's not taking his job seriously enough to engage someone who wants to give all of you a real choice. If after six months, and I don't want to get out ahead of you delegates, but if I'm fortunate enough to be the Democratic nominee, after six months, you don't think I'm right for this job, that's fine. But if he's not willing to engage with me, which means he's probably not willing to engage with you, in my view, that's grounds for firing. You know, find another job. Find a job where you actually want to be talking to people and talking to an opponent. So he's had a couple of tele-town halls. Um, I listened to the first one. Um, I'm grateful that he did it. Um, I think it's important that he at least tried to reach out again, but that doesn't excuse what follows. And what followed, I felt like, uh, was a lot of excuse making, a lot of, again, putting party over, I think, uh, policy or solutions. But the one I want to focus on is the one that was held on Thursday night, so just a few nights ago. And Ty was there, and John Zaccio, my 92-year-old Rotarian friend, soon to be 93, uh, was on the call as well. Well, I had been told by someone that uh, Stewart's team uh, filters out the hard questions. Um, I promise you I would never do that. Um, if we're fortunate enough to be in Congress one day, I would make sure that the team was not going to filter out the hard questions. I wanted to ask the hard questions because if hard questions are asked, you get to the solutions to hard problems. So I thought, well, I've got to play a little game here, and I didn't want to do it this way, but I thought, what's a question that I could could ask when they say, if you want to ask the congressman a question, hit X, and then it's pre-recorded, and then they, they vet it, and then they let you get on live. And I came up with a question, which was not a, a softball question, but I think it was an important one, and it was, you know, what about future, future legislation? This first package, I think, is intended to help people. $1,200 isn't going to help a lot for a long time. The small business program may start to work, and we'll spend more time talking about that maybe in another session. So that was my that was my question. Well, it got me through the the gauntlet. It got me through to where, ironically enough, I was the first person they went to. I then added two more questions. Um, the second question was probably, in my view, um, the one that I really wanted to ask, which is, did he support a 9/11 style commission to look at what went wrong? How did we get to the point where our doctors and nurses don't have PPE, they don't have masks, they don't have gowns? And then the third question I asked was whether he supported uh, the President uh, Trump using the uh, Defense Production Act. And those are the three. The one I want to focus on um, in the time that we've got is based on a very good article that came out the day after this Teletown Hall. And again, I'm speaking specifically to all of you in Utah who maybe weren't on the Teletown Hall and, and maybe haven't read this article that, that came out on KSL.com. And I want to thank Dennis Romboy, who wrote the piece, because when I saw it, it's titled Representative Chris Stewart Backs COVID-19 Commission, and then here's the kicker, as long as goal isn't to embarrass President Trump. So, well, guess who asked that question that got to the, I'm sure the people had it too. So I'm just going to read read how the article starts, and it's on KSL.com. Again, thank you, Dennis Romboy, for writing it. It was posted on April 3rd. Dateline Salt Lake City. Representative Chris Stewart would favor a 9-11 style commission to look at how prepared the United States was to handle a pandemic as long as it doesn't set out to embarrass President Donald Trump. Also, the Utah Republican said he worries that ongoing government-imposed social distancing restrictions could make socialism more acceptable to the country. Stewart said he would not support a review trying to blame someone for the U.S. response to the coronavirus outbreak. 
Most government agencies, he said, have done an extraordinary, though not perfect, job. That's ironic because Chris Stewart for a long time has attacked government left and right, up and down, and we'll talk more, more about that. The article goes on. He said it would, quote, probably be appropriate to examine what the nation could have done three or five years ago to better be prepared. And then this is Stewart's words. Quote, but if this is just an effort to try to diminish or embarrass the president or some of the other people that are working around him that I think generally are doing an outstanding job, I don't think that's helpful at all. Stewart said during a 45-minute telephone town hall Thursday night where he answered Utah's questions. Congress tasked an independent bipartisan panel in late 2002. I was in Iraq at the time, of course, which is ironic because Iraq had nothing to do with 9-11, to compile an account of the circumstances surrounding the September 11, 2001 terrorist attacks, including preparedness for and the immediate response to the attacks. At least two House Democrats have proposed establishing a 9-11 style commission to look into the federal government's response to the COVID-19 pandemic, which has killed more than 7,000 Americans, and that's just, that's just as of Thursday. Democrats have sharply criticized how Trump has dealt with the crisis. The article goes on. Well, we sure are criticizing for all the right reasons. I then want to just highlight a few comments that Utahns had put on the website because I think they speak very directly and eloquently about what Mr. Stewart seems to be trying to do, which is to say, we don't want accountability, especially if it embarrasses the president. We all know Mr. Stewart's background. He seems to take very lightly the professionals in our government. We remember during the last panel um, when the ambassadors, Ambassador Yovanovitch, the Lieutenant Colonel Vindeman, and how he treated them. So while he wants to rewrite his history, we won't let him do that. We won't let him rewrite his record. There's plenty of it that's on the record. So these are the comments I want to highlight, and pardon me if I read a bit more, but I think uh, these, these Utahns, and maybe some of you are listening eventually, are watching, you'll recognize what you wrote. But these really stood out to me. The first begins, Mr. Stewart should be more concerned about getting to the truth than trying to protect the president from embarrassment should it be determined it is deserved. It is unfortunate that during a national crisis we are still being given information from the top that is not always accurate. A case can be made that had the president reacted to the situation from the onset, instead of downplaying and denying it, that the crisis in the U.S. would not be as severe as it is, although it would still be serious. It is most fortunate that we have Drs. Fauci and Burks there. Hopefully, Mr. Trump will continue to allow them to do the excellent job they are doing. At the current time, we need to stick together as a nation during this most difficult episode in our history. Whether we approve or not of Mr. Trump, unity is of paramount importance at this time. Those who disapprove of the performance of any elected official will be able formally to express that this coming November. There's another one. Stewart seems to be concerned about a lot here, protecting Trump's reputation, not encouraging socialism, protecting state sovereignty, of states that are not protecting their citizens and not getting Americans used to the idea that the government will save them during a national crisis. Leadership equals vision. Why is his vision focused on everything but saving human lives? That's what every response in this interview should have been about. How do we save more lives? It's not his positions that are the problems. It's not his positions that are the problem. It's his priorities. Stop talking politics, get to work saving lives. A third one. I think Representative Stewart misses the mark on this one by saying it shouldn't embarrass Trump. Trump has made some big mistakes in responding and planning for the threat of COVID-19. That has translated into more deaths, which is tragic, which is a tragic failure and intolerable. 
Trump should be held accountable for his inaction and refusal of the WHO, the World Health Organization, test in February without finger pointing at the usual targets. People will not forget the mistakes Trump has made when we go to the polls to elect our next president. Now, the, the last comment from a, a Utah uh, following uh, Chris Stewart's Teletown Hall, uh, maybe actually two more. Um, is protecting Donald Trump from embarrassment really more important than discovering the truth and finding solutions and even pointing out our mistakes or missteps so we can do better? By the way, narcissists don't get embarrassed. They retaliate. And then the last one from Fisher Smith, time to get rid of Chris Stewart. So I could have, have listed more and I could tell you more about what I think, but I wanted to give voice to, to you Utahns who took time to get online and, and respond to a, a, a story that was based on a teletown hall. Um, my good friend John Zacchio, my 92-year-old Rotarian friend, is the one who asked the question that led to Stewart's screed on socialism, which maybe we'll have time to talk about that eventually. Um, but I want to, I just touched my face. Um, Forgive me. Um, you blur it out. <laughs> exactly. I uh, wash my hands regularly to the point where I think I'm turning... It's, it's going to end up being one of those uh, uh, social requirements that, that uh, face touching and... And I know other, we all... All the other bad habits, you know, like hugging and shaking hands are going to be... Like, you can't even appear on TV yeah, we, we, You're right. Mm -hmm. We may need to just walk into Saran Wrap in the morning and take off the Saran Wrap at night, but... Uh, the candidate in the plastic bubble. <laughs> Uh, that wouldn't probably be easy to do these social media <laughs> love fests on, but we might try it. It's a different kind of bubble. Kind of in the bubble. It's, yeah, we're all in a bubble right now, that's for sure. Um, I like this informal you know, back and forth, which is why uh, we'll continue to do this, and you'll get to meet more of our team over time as we follow all the medical guidelines. But but what the Stuart Teletown Hall, I think, really demonstrated is unfortunate. I don't like to highlight failure in our leaders. Um, I don't like to think about how public policy has failed to the point that people die. That said, comma, it's incumbent, I think, on all of us to hold our elected officials accountable when they fail or when they seem to do their job not about representing us, but about protecting the leader of their party. If a Democratic president had handled this crisis the way it's been handled, and if I were in Congress as a Democrat, I promise you I would not sound like Chris Stewart. I would try and be respectful, but I would highlight where those failures have been. Because governing at the end of the day is a very, very serious business. And when I started to run a few months ago, Reviews were sometimes good, sometimes not. But one of the comments were, was, Kale, you're so serious. And I kind of wanted to be like, well, read this book. Google Fallujah. That makes me kind of serious about what good or bad government can mean. Now, I think, given everything that's going on, it's kind of important that we have serious people and serious jobs. And, of course, what's more serious than trying to find solutions to a global pandemic that's going to kill more people and unnecessarily kill people that probably wouldn't have been killed if we had been more on top of what our elected officials are paid to do. Our elected officials are paid to make sure our national stockpile is not low, that it's high. Um, they're paid to think about worst-case scenarios, not best-case scenarios only. Life can suck. Life can be deadly and life can get you hurt and life can kill you if you're not prepared. And I think that's what the wars taught me. There's a veneer of civilization. Uh, Ty and I were talking about this earlier that we don't have as much time to get into, but what a place like Fallujah and what these wars taught me over seven years is that the veneer of civilization is very thin. And the only thing that gets us through that is how we treat each other when the law may not be there to protect you. It's based on how you protect each other. Um, and I think all of us have felt uncomfortable if you go to a store and you see a long line. Hey, we're, we're America. We're not supposed to have that. Well, there's a lot of people hurting, and I hope some of you are listening. And I think Chris Stewart, unfortunately, um, 
isn't in the line of business he probably was made out to be in and really enjoys. I've heard that he doesn't like to particularly meet with people, and when he's in Salt Lake, he has stood up and said pretty much verbatim in his last town hall in person, which was a, a year or two ago, or longer even, he said, I don't need your vote. And that was incredibly dismissive to a huge part of his district. I like the second district because it's big, it's beautiful, it's complicated. As I run to seek your vote and your support, again, whether you're a Republican, whether you may even have voted for Donald Trump, that's okay. You can always pay penance and vote for me. <laughs> Truly. We, we, we all make mistakes in life, but whatever got you to the ballot box on your issues, um, I, I hope in the conversation that we can have going forward that what you're going to get from me <clears throat> is serious and you're going to get from me the truth. Um, and that's where I think, unfortunately, Chris Stewart has failed. If he had been a great representative, why would I, why would I run? I mean... I like writing, I like teaching. I'm a pretty private person. Being in the public eye is not what I woke up doing since I was in junior high or high school, and that was a heck of a lot different. Um, but I'm gonna end maybe with a story, because um, we're, I know, running out of your time and you'd probably rather be streaming something more interesting and maybe more educational. Um, less serious. A lot less serious, and one day I'll tell you what I'm streaming, um, and you can tell people what you're streaming, and we can turn on 103.1 at the end, because it reminds me of the 80s, which is the best music ever produced, but maybe we can cl do some good audio clips on the front end and the back end, and Ty's younger than I am, but he professes to know a lot about 80s music, and I guess it's kind of true, because I've learned that he does know a lot about 80s music, which is surprising, because I thought only those of us who grew up in the 80s know how great that era was. I'm sidetracked there. Governing is a serious business, and I'm a serious guy, um, for better and for worse. Um, but I'm going to end with a story from the war zones. It's going to be a story from um, Afghanistan. And I, I told this story when I was meeting with our friends in the labor labor unions. And, and we can spend a segment one of these weeks on why labor is important and why I fundamentally believe, as the grandson of a Union Pacific Railroader, that we need unions. We need protections of workers. The Germans are good at it. Uh, they're a lot better than we are at it. We'll talk more about that. doesn't mean I'm anti-business per se. My younger brother is a very good business person and he's applying for these programs as well. Uh, we'll get into those issues later. Um, it's a serious business and I believe now is the time we need serious people back in government. We need the professionals back. Um, but the story I'm going to tell um, is from East, um, Eastern Afghanistan and, and Fallujah. When I uh, was younger, um, didn't have any gray hair at the time, I would go into the meetings with the Iraqi and Afghan leaders with a, with a green notebook, you know, that's issued by the military. And, you know, you'd, you'd pull it out and take notes, and eventually the Iraqis and the Afghans would say, oh, you're, you're another American, pulling out your notebook, taking notes, and then you leave, and that's all, we, that's all we ever get is, you know, scribbles and silence. And eventually I said, what I'm going to tell you, <clears throat> and I'm very serious about this as a serious person, um, I used to say to them, whether they were the governors or the mayors or the religious leaders or the tribal leaders, I always keep the promises I make, which is why I don't make very many. I always keep the promises I make, which is why I don't make very many. And it's actually a good policy, not just in a war zone, but it's a good policy in life. Um, so when I make a promise, I keep it. And the promise I'll make to you, night one of what I think will be an ongoing conversation is, is that if you'll tune in, if we can have a conversation over weeks, if not months, if that's what it takes, I promise you I'll treat this job seriously and that I'll never forget that I work for you. And I'll make a promise April 4th, is it Saturday, April 4th, today, that if I fail in that, and if I get the nomination and I'm lucky enough to, to win, if I fail in that, you should fire me. Fire me in two years. You know, Orrin Hatch, this politician in Utah, once said he'd be in the Senate for two terms and he ended up being in Washington for 50 years. I don't know anyone in their right mind who would want to spend half a century in Washington. Um, so I'll make that promise to you, that if, if you hire me, 
uh, you'll always have the right to fire me if I fail. Um, and that's as true for Democrats who might nominate me to be your nominee or for voters out there who your conscience may be getting to you, that maybe you're willing to cross over and vote for, for a Democrat who maybe has a lot of experience that's relevant right now. So that's, that's the promise I'll make. I'll probably make one or two more, but you don't get a lot of promises from me because I always keep the ones I make. And I think it's important that we get leaders who understand that. This is about that bond, I think, and I'll, I'll end with this. This is about the bond, I think, that we, we need between each other as neighbors. We need to be better neighbors because right now being better neighbors is how we're surviving. Um, our government's trying to do its best to, to help us get back on our, our feet. Um, but if we can help each other, uh, maybe at the end of this, we'll, we'll be a better community. We'll be a community that isn't about building walls, but about building bridges. It will be a community uh, that isn't red and blue America. We'll be a community that will say, I'm not going to use fear to divide people. People are genuinely afraid right now, and we understand that. But to use fear to divide people, in my view, is wrong. It's what gets us to the point where our government fails. This campaign is only possible with donations, whether it's 20 bucks or for some people, and we've had generous donors who have donated all the way up to 2,800. Um, I hate to ask for it. I hate to dial for dollars. But if you are so inclined to invest, you can go to westonforcongress.com. There's a link there, uh, donate button. So enough about the money. But I believe we need to get to public financing because if we get to public financing, I never have to ask for money. We can talk about issues, and that's what we need in our leaders. But until we get there, we need people in government who know what a mortgage is, who know what it's like to flip burgers and to make blizzards at Dairy Queen like I did, because otherwise you're only going to get what tend to be rich old white guys. I'm getting older, but I'm not rich. And I think if we don't get people in government who have lived through life, with ups and downs and falling into cracks, and someday I'll tell you about the cracks I've fallen into. I told it to a few people, but it's not part of our biography that we usually like to highlight. Um, I think you'll understand I'm, I'm a lot more relatable than, quote, a guy who worked for the State Department for 11 years. But that's our website. This is our logo. Thanks for spending half an hour, 45 minutes, whatever this ends up being with us, and we look forward uh, to next time. We're going to get out and about. Um, we're going to try and talk about the people that don't have the option of staying in a, a dining room. Uh, we're going to probably go to a rail yard. Uh, we may be able to talk about what it's like to stock groceries uh, to make sure we're all fed. Uh, you can reach me directly at kael at westonforcongress.com. Um, feel free to do that. If you have ideas, if you have issues, if you think we can do something better, uh, if you don't like me, that's fine too. Um, hate mail keeps us on us, um, but the other kind is usually better if it's constructive. And we'll be back. So thank you, Ty, for making this happen round one. Um, I'm learning a lot on social media, and I think we'll be able to, to reach out as best we can. So thanks again. Did you want to say anything? Sayonara. Sayonara. And we'll turn uh, the 80s music back on now and figure out how we're going to edit this. So thank you. That's kind of fun. Yeah. I don't know how we did. <laughs> uh, we'll get better at it. <laughs>